The Cambrian, which took place 541 million years ago to about 488 million years ago, is the geologic period in which we see the first fossil evidence of most modern animal phyla. In this video, we're going to talk about the key characteristics of many of the, the most prominent animal phyla that we see in the geologic record and that still exist today. So stay tuned. Hi, and thanks for tuning in. The Cambrian period from about 541 million years ago to 488 million years ago brought an end to the Precambrian. And it brought an end to the final period of the Precambrian known as the Ediacaran. During the Cambrian, the most prominent event that would take place was marked in the fossil record is known as the Cambrian explosion. The Cambrian explosion refers to the abundance of fossils found from modern animal phyla, which weren't found prior to the Cambrian during the Ediacaran. But these fossils will then persist throughout the fossil record from the Cambrian onward into the modern era. Now, in a previous video, I talked about what the Cambrian explosion is. I talked about some possible explanations for why the Cambrian explosion appeared the way it did and why it might not have been an explosion in the first place. I don't want to focus on that in this video since there's already a video out there about that. Instead, what I'm going to talk about in this video are the different phyla that we see in the Cambrian record. Talk about many of the important phyla that we'll be following throughout evolutionary history in the remainder of these videos about the geologic and evolutionary history of life on Earth. And we'll talk about the key characteristics or the shared derived traits that each of these phyla have that define them as unique animal phyla. So if we, if we go back in our time machines to about 541 million years ago, we would see that the Earth looks significantly different than it does today. First off, we're still looking at a planet in which uh, Pinocchio uh, was still in the process of having been broken up. So we have lots of scattered land throughout the planet, but it doesn't really matter because there is no life on Earth. Life is still within these warm oceans. It was also a period of great warmth on the planet Earth. It was driven mainly by a greenhouse climate with high levels of carbon dioxide. There were no glaciers and the oceans, ocean levels were very high. This is actually quite conducive to life, particularly at this point in time uh, on the planet Earth because much of life lived within the shallow oceans. The shallow, warm oceans of the Cambrian Earth were, uh, were hotbeds of evolution. Um, and we also have a couple other things going on. Uh, there are increasing levels of calcium appearing in the oceans. And we also see that oxygen concentrations were high but on the rise at that time. So this is, this is the background upon which most modern animal phyla begin appearing in the fossil record. So the first group, uh, the first phylum of animals that we'll talk about are the sponges, also known as the periphera. So the sponges are the simplest of all animals, and molecular evidence indicates that the lineage that gave rise to the sponges may have uh, first appeared over 700 million years ago. But sponges uh, are interesting and they're unique in the animal kingdom in the fact that they are asymmetrical. And this is probably down to the fact that they, uh, while they do have unique cell types, they do have differentiated cells, which define them as truly multicellular animals. They do not have specialized tissues. So we talked in a previous video about, uh, the, about the ectoderm, the endoderm, and the mesoderm. They have none of those. Instead, uh, they're going to consist of different cell types. Um, the way they eat is, is working as, as filter feeders. So the adult, uh, adult sponges are all sessile filter feeders, which means they're attached to a substrate, to a surface, usually the sea floor, and they don't move. However, the larvae are actually motile, and essentially they swim until they reach a place uh, that they choose to call home. They attach themselves to that substrate, and they never move again. So they filter feed through pores, typically in the side, or they can go through the main hole at the top of the sponge known as the osculum or oscula, pluralized. Um, the movement of the water in order to allow filter feeding is done by a specialized cell known as a coanocyte. This is the cell that is, um, is linked to uh, a group of protists known as the coanoflagellates. You see that they have these little cilia around a contractile collar. They use their flagella, they beat it rapidly in order to introduce a water current, and then they use those cilia around those collar cells uh, to uh, sort of pull food, to strain food uh, out of their water, and then the water is then vented out through, typically through the oscula uh, in the center of the sponge. The food is then transported to dedicated cells 
uh, within the sponge body and then distributed, uh, processed metabolically and then distributed throughout the, throughout the sponge in order to make sure that the cell that the cells are all fed appropriate amounts of nutrition. Reproduction in sponges is unique. They can do so through fragmenting in some ways. So that would be an asexual version of reproduction, but they can also um, turn, they can also produce gametes. So for example, uh, the way they do it is interesting. While they lack dedicated gamete tissue, they actually are able to turn certain cells that already exist in their body into reproductive cells. So for example, sperm cells are produced from specialized choanocytes, whereas egg cells are produced from another group of cells that are responsible for moving nutrition throughout the body called amoebocytes, uh, and these can actually become the egg. Uh, typically, sperm is just sort of blasted out of the male sponge, um, and then hopefully some of it lands uh, inside of the osculum of the female sponge where it can meet with the egg and, and fertilization can occur and reproduction happens. But sponges are the simplest of, of all uh, animal of the animal phyla. And the reason why, quite simply, is they're asymmetrical, they're sessile, and they lack dedicated tissues. So no mesoderm, no ectoderm, no endoderm, and no symmetry. The next phylum we'll talk about is phylum Nadaria, also known as the Nadarians, and you probably know them more commonly as things with stinging tentacles. So these are going to be things like jellyfish, box jellyfish, hydras, man of war, coral. Uh, all of these are in the phylum Nadaria. So there are actually uh, the distinct classes of Nadarians, um, and each of those that I just spoke about belong to a different class. Uh, I'm not going to get into that level of knowledge in this particular video. I think it's beyond the scope. But instead, what I want to focus on are what are the key characteristics that make all Nadarians Nadarians? Well, unlike sponges, Nadarians are going to have true tissues. They are your, uh, they're going to be your diploblasts. So they're going to have the ectoderm on the outside and the endoderm on the inside, but they're not going to have a mesoderm. Uh, instead, they're going to have a mesoglia, which is a gelatinous inner layer that's uh, basically secreted by the ectoderm and the endoderm. And that's why all of these sort of have that gelatinous texture to them is from that mesoglia that sort of fills up their bodies and gives them that texture. As diploblasts, they are also going to have radial symmetry. So there's a top and a bottom, but there are no sides. They're all round. They have this sort of round uh, body plan. They can exist in two forms. They can exist either as a polyp, uh, as we see with, uh, with uh, hydra, for example, or they can exist as a medusa in the case of jellyfish. But many species actually exist both as a polyp or at some point in their life and then a medusa and others. So, for example, baby jellyfish don't actually look like jellyfish. They actually look at, like a polyp, and then eventually they end up uh, getting their adult body form, which is in the form of a medusa. One of their shared derived traits is they all possess a particular uh, type of cell uh, called a nidocyte. Uh, this actually has a, uh, a, a, a unique organelle inside of it called a nematocyst, which is a stinging cell. It actually sends a harpoon-like structure out and allows uh, these animals to uh, sting their prey, uh, which is why nobody wants to be around a jellyfish or a Portuguese man of war or a box jellyfish like an irukandji uh, because their stings can be incredibly painful. It's these stings that are used to uh, paralyze their prey and allow them to ingest it uh, through their mouths and, and process them in their gastro vascular cavity. Because of their overall soft body plans, we don't have a huge fossil record of most Nadarians, with the exception of a few species. Corals, for example, and the fact that they have a lot of these hardened parts um, in the form of modern day coral reefs, but coral reefs also existed throughout a lot of geologic history. Um, have, we have a great fossil record of corals, um, and they actually can be quite informative about types of uh, ecologic changes that have occurred on the planet. Uh, we see in many cases that coral reef uh, levels fluctuate and that usually correlates with changes in conditions that are favorable or disfavorable for life. High levels of coral reefs equal life is typically doing well and low abundance of coral reefs typically mean that life is not doing particularly well. So coral, reef, coral reefs are actually quite important uh, in terms of helping us to sort of order and figure out what's going on in terms of the fossil record. The remainder of the species that we'll be talking about, the remainder of the animal phyla that we'll be talking about are all going to be triploblasts, and they're also going to be known as bilaterians. So they're all going to have all three germ layers. They're going to have the ectoderm, the endoderm, and in between that, another layer known as the mesoderm. And the mesoderm is particularly important for the evolution of animals because it's going to give rise to lots of different structures, particularly connective tissue, but it's also going to allow for the formation in some animal phyla 
of a coelom. So a coelom actually is a body cavity that houses the internal organs. It's actually quite protective. And one of the things that we often do when we look at animals, animal phyla is classify them as either being uh, coelomates, as in they possess a true coelom, acelomates, meaning they have no coelom, which means they're typically like solid bodied, or they could be pseudo coelomates, which usually means that they have sort of a watery or an aqueous layer that separates um, the mesoderm from the endoderm. So we'll talk about these different types of coelomes or the absence of these coelomes as we go through the different animal phyla because it is a defining char characteristic of some of them. Now, the first group of, of bilaterians that we'll talk about are the acelomates. So acelomates are this interesting group of species. They're probably some of the simplest triple blasts on the planet Earth. Um, and they're actually believed to possibly have evolved from a form of a nadarian polyp um, because there are significant um, molecular and anatomic similarities uh, in terms of their structure. What's interesting about acelomates is they don't have a coelom at all. They're solid bodied. Um, the majority of them are going to be marine, and they live typically in, in, uh, along, the, along the floor, uh, 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 the bottom of the ocean or the bottom of their aqueous environment uh, in which they live. They, they typically have a mouth but no anus. Uh, they don't really have much in the way of um, you know, a digestive tract or a cardiovascular system or anything like that. But what they do have is a fairly simple uh, nervous system. And one of the things that we see in acelomates is the first sort of simple approaches at something that's known as cephalization. So once you have a bilateral body plan, some interesting things are going to happen. Not only do you have a top and a bottom, but you also have a left and a right. You also then have a head and a tail. So you have all three axes that you must be aware of on your body plan, whereas radially symmetric species like a jellyfish is just round. So there's up and down and that's it. What starts to happen is the localization of sensory organs or sensory tissues near the head end of the animal. And if you think about it, this makes sense, right? It, you want to put it as close to the mouth as you possibly can because acquiring food is job one as a species. If you don't eat, you're going to die. So it makes sense to start putting a lot of that sensation apparatus near the mouth end, which would eventually become the head of the organism. And we do start to see this in acelomates, albeit at a very rudimentary level. We're going to start to see it become more and more pronounced in different animal phyla as we go. Just like the acelomorpha we just spoke about, platyhelminthes are a group of worm-like species that are also acelomates. So when we talk about platyhelminthes, we're talking about uh, species uh, like planaria, uh, we're also talking about uh, planaria, which is representative of the group, uh, a class known as the tubularians. Uh, there are also um, cestodes, which are uh, tapeworms, for example, fall into this group as well. Just like we saw with, uh, with the acelomorpha, these are going to be acelomates, so they are so essentially soft body. But what we do start to see uh, with respect to many of these species, particularly the tubularians, is we're going to see that these species are going to have a significantly more complex nervous system. So for example, when we look at uh, planaria, we see that they have you know, uh, two ventral nerve cords that are connected to a nerve ring uh, uh, in the head area or in the, cep the, the, the cephalized region of the body, but they also have eye spots. So uh, many tubularians are at least sensitive in some way to light, and they act as, uh, act as aqueous predators going around and eating things in their watery environment and using those eye spots to help them find prey and avoid predation. Unlike the, uh, the turbolarians like planaria, if we look at tapeworms and another group of uh, platyhelminthes uh, that are known as the flukes, um, they do not have eye spots and they have some significantly less complex nervous systems. The one thing to note about all platyhelminthes is they have a single opening, uh, just like we see with the acelomorpha. These are in that group of protostomes where that original opening that happens during gastrulation, uh, that is going to become the mouth. Most all, all of these species have a mouth but no anus, so they have a single opening in which both mouth, uh, which food and waste must pass through. Another phylum of worm-like animals are known as the Nemertia. So the Nemertia are also known as ribbon worms. Now, unlike platyhelminthes and the acelomorpha that we spoke about before, Nemertia are true coelomates. So they actually do have a true coelom. And accordingly, they have significantly more complex body plan. 
So they actually have, uh, they, they are mainly marine. Uh, some of them are freshwater and they're even some ter uh, terrestrial species, but they all eat using a specialized organ known as a, as a proboscis, which is enclosed in something called a uh, rhinco seal. They actually extend this proboscis to sort of consume their prey uh, and ingest them whole. They also have a fairly complex digestive system as well as a circulatory system. Uh, the circulatory system allows, uh, allows oxygen to be circulated throughout the cells of the body, although respiration is still going to happen through the cuticle. So it's going to come through the, through the skin, through the hypodermis, uh, so they don't have lungs or gills to breathe that way. What's interesting about ribbon worms is um, they're widely considered by pretty much every animal it seems to be as gross and disgusting. They have almost no known natural predators, so apparently nothing wants to eat these things uh, because they're so weird. Uh, but uh, they are very important uh, predators within uh, mar many marine environments, um, eating small invertebrates uh, as part of their diet. Uh, the other thing to note is that Nervatia also have a fairly complex nervous system, uh, kind of like what we saw with the um, with the uh, turbolarian group of uh, platyhelminthes. They're going to have a pair of nerve cords, uh, and that's going to be connected to. Uh, to some ganglia in the head region and a pair of eye spots uh, that help them to perceive the world around them. The next animal phyla, Nematoda, actually is another group of worms, and these are the round worms. So uh, there are about 25,000 defined species of nematodes on the planet. They are actually one of the most abundant species on the planet Earth, um, and they can be found in pretty much every environment. Um, they're about evenly split 50-50 between free-living nematodes like C. elegans and parasitic nematodes like Ascaris sum, uh, which, are in, which are intestinal parasites uh, that live off of um, animal hosts. So um, while nematodes are, are essential for many different processes on the earth as decomposers and so on and so forth, they're also a great cause of morbidity and mortality in both livestock uh, and human beings uh, be that they can infect um, and cause great harm and even death to in some cases. So nematodes are interesting as they are a group of pseudocelomates. The way you can think of a nematode body plan is sort of a tube within a tube. Uh, within a tube. So you have the mesoderm and then you have this sort of fluid filled layer called the pseudocelome and then you get to, uh, then you get to um, the, the endoderm that forms like the intestines or on the other side you have the ectoderm which forms the the hypodermis, okay? So this is what a pseudocelomic body plan looks like. Uh, nematodes also happen to be my favorite animals. They, uh, C. elegans is a species that I studied um, as, uh, as a graduate student and in my postgraduate work, so uh, very near and dear to my heart. What's awesome about nematodes is that although they are fairly simple in terms of their overall body plan, they are actually incredibly complex. They have highly developed nervous systems consisting of hundreds of different nerve cells uh, that form a fairly complex ganglia uh, near the head region of the body. Um, uh, uh, they have uh, four different nerve cords that are connected by these uh, sort of cross connections known as commissures. Uh, you can see them highlighted in this picture where the cells have been highlighted with a fluorescent protein known as GFP. As a result, they actually have highly complex behaviors. You can actually teach nematodes to do things in certain scenarios, so they actually have the ability to learn. Despite the fact that they're completely blind, they have no eyes, uh, they navigate their environment uh, through olfactory sensation. So nematodes uh, are a particularly interesting group of, of, of animals, in both in terms of their essential capabilities as well as um, you know, on the planet Earth, as well as their ability to influence human health and wellness. The other thing that's cool about them is they have a well-developed digestive system. So many of them possess something called a pharynx, uh, which is used for grinding up their food. Uh, they have an intestine and an anus. So they have two openings in this case, although they are still protostomes, uh, where the, the original opening is the mouth and the anus develops later. This brings us to our final phylum of worm-like species, uh, and these are the annelids. So the annelids are very interesting in the fact that, yes, they are true coelomates. In fact, uh, they're actually... Uh, possess two coelomes, um, but the cool part is when we get to the annelids, it's really the first group of species where we see true segmentation, which is also known as metamerism. So when we look at species like bristle worms or earthworms or leeches, we see that there are true body segments. So why is segmentation so important? Segmentation is important because, and we'll see it in several other groups, including the arthropods and, uh, and the chordates, uh, what, what's hugely important about segmentation is 
it sort of allows body plans to be built, adapted, and modified on a modular basis. Because when you have a segmented body plan, you can sort of alter one segment to and without impacting the others. Or you can build or add on to the body plan by just simply adding on other segments. It's almost like having a body plan built out of Legos. You can interchange this Lego, change this Lego to a different color, make this a slightly bigger Lego, but overall it doesn't affect the entire body plan, it just affects that segment. So this modular body plan seems to be very conducive to evolutionary adaptation, as we'll see when we get to the chordates and the arthropods as well. Now the annelids, like I said, consist of three groups. There, you have the polychaetes, which are bristle worms, which are predominantly marine. Uh, you have your oligochaetes, which are going to be your earthworm type species. Uh, and then you're going to have your funnel group, which are, which are the leeches. Uh, leeches, I know we tend to think of as being parasites because the leeches that we encounter uh, in our everyday life are, are actually bloodsuckers. However, there are plenty of free living leeches that are just aquatic predators that don't want to live off of blood or anything like that. So perhaps they're getting a bit of a bad rap. When we see the annelids, the key characteristics is that they're all going to have some amount of, of hairs. These keats, hence the term polychaete, many hairs, uh, legal keat, some hairs uh, on, the, on the outside of them that are going to be used to facilitate movement. Uh, they are true coelomates. They also have highly complex cardiovascular systems, although they still rely on uh, they, they still typically rely on cutaneous respiration. What's interesting is when we look at annelids, their blood actually contains hemoglobin. So it actually contains the same uh, oxygen carrying molecule that our red blood cells carry as well. So breaking free from the worm-like species, uh, let's talk quickly about the bryozoans. So the phylum bryozoa is an interesting group of, of species. Uh, they live sort of a colonial lifestyle with different individuals coming together to form a colony. But what's interesting is once they begin their co colonial lifestyle, each individual takes on a specific responsibility within the colony. So some of them act in colonial defense. Some of them will specialize strictly in reproduction. Some of them will specialize in simply acquiring food. Um, and some will, you know, sort of just act as sort of the main body of the organism. So they sort of differentiate from individuals into a multicellular organism. It's, it's a very unique lifestyle. Uh, they're found almost exclusively in marine environments. Uh, they often use tentacles uh, in the form of, as a form of defense as, and as a form of food acquisition. One of the main reasons why we talk about them, despite the fact that they're a sort of very small file of animals in modern times, is the fact that because of their body plan and because they exist in the ocean, uh, they fossilize quite well. So quite often following bryozoans can be useful in helping us sort of figure out what's going on in terms of which strata these rocks should belong to and so on and so forth. Next we have the brachiopods. So brachiopods are a group of animals uh, that have shells and they have two shells. So in that sense, they look a lot like mollusks known as bivalves. So they look a lot like clams. But the difference is this, they actually exist in a top and bottom format. So uh, they have a top shell and a bottom shell. Okay. Now you may think, well, clams have a top shell and a bottom shell too. Not technically. Technically clams have a left and a right shell. Um, we just set them on their left or their right shell when they're on our plates because they sit better that way. But in real life, they typically exist uh, upwards. Um, with the left and right shell. It has to do with their symmetry. Brachiopods, on the other hand, have a top and a bottom shell. Now there are two different types. You have your articulate species, which sort of have something known as a, which has something known as a pedicule. Uh, and they basically are, they almost look like flowers uh, in the ocean sediment with their shells pointing upwards to allow them to acquire food. And then you have your inarticulate ones, which usually either bury um, their, their pedicule structure or they attach themselves to the seafloor uh, with their bottom shell. And then they use uh, then they use that as a way of they use their their mouths to sort of ingest food in that way. Uh, what's really interesting is there's a species known as lingula, which is technically an inarticulate um, an inarticulate brachiopod. Um, as far as we can tell, lingula has been around since like the Cambrian period. Um, with very little change that's occurred. So it's almost like a living fossil uh, when you look at this thing. Uh, it's particularly interesting. You can see a picture of it here. So uh, these, are, uh, these are the uh, brachiopods. They're very important because they fossilize really, really well, and we can actually follow the evolution of brachiopods throughout, basically from the Cambrian onwards. Um, and they give us a great indication of kind of what's going on in which geologic time period we're talking about. There were also major components of the of the C4 biota from the Cambrian through uh, through the Ordovician and some of the earlier time periods in which these phylum these phyla existed.
This brings us to one of the most successful animal phyla in the history of the planet Earth, the mollusks. So the mollusks are, uh, are the largest group of marine species on the planet Earth, with 23% of all marine species belonging to this one animal phylum. So mollusks uh, are, are defined by three, three key characteristics. Uh, they're all going to have, or at some point in their lifetime, have a shell. They are going to have a visceral mass, uh, which includes their internal organs, and they're all going to have a foot. Now, what's interesting about the mollusk body plan is how it has been adapted in several different classes of mollusks to do different things. So, for example, in some species, the shell is predominant. In other species, the shell is completely absent. And, and then we'll talk in just a minute about what happens with the foot, which has been adapted to do lots of different things. So there are several different classes of mollusks. So for example, you have bivalva, which is going to include species uh, like uh, species like uh, um, um, clams and, and mussels and, and species like that. You're going to have your gastropods. So your gastropods are going to include groups of snails and slugs. And snails can be both marine or they can be terrestrial. We're all very familiar with land snails. We see them around all the time. Slugs are simply snails that don't have shells. They're, they're literally the same species, just some have shells and the same group of species. Some have shells and some don't, but they're all in that group of gastropoda. And then you have the most intelligent invertebrates on the planet Earth also belonging to phylum mollusca, which are the cephalopods. These are a group of species that have completely lost their shell over evolutionary time, which may actually contribute to their high levels of intelligence. Now, overwhelmingly, mollusks are not super intelligent, um, but their body plan has allowed them to do so many wonderful things, which is what makes them so successful. First off, the ones that have retained their shells are highly armored. They use their powerful muscular foot to propel them uh, either through the water column or along the floor. I know we tend to think of clams as being these non-motile things. They do move actually quite well underwater using their very powerful foot. Snails have adapted that foot for movement as well, except their foot is underneath of them. And they use it to either cr swim in the water or crawl along the land. And, and they secrete like a, an, an oozy, sticky substance to allow them to move on land. That same foot has actually been readapted in, uh, in, um, in cephalopods to, uh, use, to, to do a form of jet propulsion, which is the way that they move so rapidly. So when we look at how fast a squid or an octopus or a nautilus can move through the water, that's because their foot has been wonderfully adapted to, to be able to allow them to use water as a form of jet propulsion, which is uh, completely amazing. Now, like I said, high levels of intelligence aren't found in most mollusk species, mollusk species but the cephalopods are an extreme example. Octopus and squid have been found to do some very incredible feats of intelligence, particularly the octopus. And this might have to do very simply with the fact that over time, these species have lost the protection that the shell afforded them. So in order to survive, they've had to become ingenious. There are cases in which it's been observed octopi uh, hiding within coconut shells. They'll find two different halves of a coconut, hide inside of it, and wait to ambush prey. There are all these videos you can see on YouTube and other places of octopuses escaping from their enclosures or using tools, for example. They're hyper intelligent. And one of the main reasons why is in order to survive, they've likely had to be, they've likely been able had to basically adapt to life without a shell that would offer them that, that protection that most other mollusks have. And indeed, that's how most mollusks sort of weather attacks. They just curl up into their shell and they go away until the attacker leaves. Although there are some ingenious predators that have found ways to drill through them or rip them open and so on and so forth. One of the interesting things that we see about early mollusks, particularly early cephalopods, is you can actually see the evolution of them losing that shell. So one of the things we'll talk about early on is something called the nautiloid cephalopods. When we get to the Ordovician period or the end of the Cambrian, we start to see these nautiloid cephalopods, which sort of look like a character out of Mario Brothers. Uh, there's these little squid things in Mario Brothers that have these little swirly shells on top. That is what a nautiloid cephalopod looked like. The early ancestors of modern day squid and octopi did have a shell that just gradually reduced over time to increase mobility while costing them protection. But if you want to talk about successful species, we have to talk about the arthropods. The arthropods are the most successful species on the planet Earth right now. And in fact, they can be found in every ecological niche, both on land and in water. Uh, arthropods are those species that have a segmented body plan and jointed appendages. This is, of course, is going to include hexapods like insects. It's going to include myriapods, so millipedes and centipedes. It's going to include crustaceans, so things like shrimp, lobster, crabs. Uh, it's also going to include 
uh, species, uh, now ex extinct group of species known as the trilobites. And the trilobites were hugely important in the Cambrian, uh, in, the, in the Cambrian fossil record because when we see them appear in the Cambrian fossil record, they are all, all are already heavily diversified, meaning there were lots of different species in existence already at the beginning of the Cambrian. It's one of the reasons why the term explosion came to be applied to this particular event in history because of how many species there already were when we start to observe them. And one of the things we'll be talking about for the first few geologic periods is how these trilobites actually change over time. Now, of course, those species are now gone, but our, plant, our planet is now dominated uh, in terms of the ocean by species of crab, of shrimp. On land, we see uh, the chelicerates, uh, which is another class uh, which includes spiders uh, and scorpions and things like that. We also see, of course, the abundance of insects on the planet Earth, which are intimately tied with the success of modern day angiosperms, so flowering plants and there's a whole relationship that we're going to start talking about in a few hundred million years about how plants and arthropods uh, really came together to dominate the planet Earth, uh, at least the modern day version of the planet Earth that we see today. The last two groups we'll talk about are unique and related in the sense that they are all into this superphylum known as, uh, deuter uh, as deuterostomes. So in a previous video, we talked about development. One of the things we talked about is how there's always this initial opening that's going to uh, form the digestive tract. In every animal species that we've spoken about so far, that initial opening becomes a mouth. They are protostomes. However, echinoderms and chordates are deuterostomes. That initial opening actually becomes the anus with the mouth actually developing later. So when we talk about echinoderms, we're going to talk about uh, a group of species that whose adults have pentaradial symmetries. They have that star-like pattern, and we're talking about sea stars, brittle stars, species like that. So uh, why do we call them, why do we consider them to be um, uh, bilaterians? Well, because during their larval stages, they actually are bilaterally symmetric. Uh, for a time, it's just the adults have this pentaradial body plan uh, that we see here. Now, echinoderms are actually going to have sort of a rigid uh, endoskeleton. They're going to have a water vascular system that allows them to move oxygen throughout their bodies. And they're also going to have these tube feet uh, that allow them to walk. The phylum Echinodermata is going to include both sea stars and brittle stars. They're considered two different classes. It's also going to uh, include uh, sea cucumbers, sea urchins, sand dollars, uh, and then another group of species known as the crinoids, which actually look like uh, plants, but they're actually animals. And then another group of extinct species known as the paracrinoids, uh, which no longer exist. Uh, crinoids are actually very important because they do fossilize quite well. Actually, most of these species fossilize quite well. So we have a pretty good fossil record of these, and we can follow their evolution throughout geologic time quite well. So we'll be talking about them uh, more and more and more as we go throughout the different geologic periods. The last group of deuterostomes are the chordates. Uh, and chordates are the phylum to which we belong. And so uh, when we talk about chordates, uh, chordates first appear in the fossil record during the Cambrian. Uh, the simplest ones are going to be species that resemble modern day lancelets, uh, which are these sort of fish-like species that sort of implant themselves in the ground. And when we talk about chordates, they're all going to have four key characteristics. All chordates are going to possess, at some point during their development or in their adult lifetime, they're all going to possess a structure known as the notochord. They're also going to possess a dorsal hollow nerve cord. We call it our spinal cord. They're going to possess a post-anal tail. Ours happens to go away. And they're going to pr produce something called pharyngeal arches or gill slits, which in many species go away as well. The simplest of chordates, things like lancelets, are going to possess all four of those characteristics throughout their development and in their adult life. Well, in many species, one or more of these characteristics will go away or be repurposed or exapted for a new purpose in their adult body plan. Now, when we look at the evolution of chordate species, we start with very simple species that simply have this dorsal hollow nerve cord as well as the three other shared drive traits. However, over time, we begin to see the, the body plans become more complex, giving rise to the first craniates, which is the use of uh, a bone-like material to protect the, protect the brain, essentially. And we see that uh, early on in species known as hagfish, which are fish that are, they're called invertebrate fish. Essentially, they're fish that have a, a they have a, a brain case, but they don't have any vertebrae. When we look at lamprey, though, for example, we now see the first appearance of vertebrae. So they have both a brain case as well as vertebrae to protect their spinal cord. And this is where we get into uh, the group known as the vertebrates, to which we belong. Over time, we'll begin to see this body plan get more and more complex. Eventually, these groups, eventually these vertebrate fish will give rise to 
uh, a group of jawless armored fish by the end of the Cambrian known as the astracoderms. And over time, we'll begin to see more and more different species of fish, eventually giving rise to a group of lobe fin fish, which would give rise to all modern tetrapods and eventually give rise to human beings. So this is where we tie into this grand evolutionary picture. The first appearance of our ancestors, the early chordates, appears during the Cambrian. And that's the thing. All of these phyla that I just spoke about appear heavily in the fossil record for the first time during the Cambrian period. And so you can see why it was very easy for early researchers to term this the Cambrian explosion. Where did all these animal phyla come from? Well, as I explained in a previous video, there are lots of explanations for why we just see the fossils of these species during the Cambrian. It doesn't necessarily mean that these species didn't exist or the ancestors of these species didn't exist well prior to the Cambrian. And there's lots of reasons for why that could be the case. What we're going to talk about moving forward is how do these animal phyla change over time? But we're also going to talk about in the next video the appearance of plants when we get to the Ordovician. The Cambrian period would come to an end about 488.3 million years ago, giving rise to the Ordovician. And the Ordovician would see some pretty momentous events in the history of life on Earth. One of the most important will actually be our first mass extinction event. Stay tuned for that in my next video. Thank you so much for tuning in today. I hope you learned a lot about the different major groups of animals that exist on the planet Earth that first appeared in the Cambrian rock strata. We'll be talking more about these animal phyla moving forward in subsequent videos. We'll talk about how these species changed over time, how certain species appeared and how they disappeared and how they began to change the Earth in which they exist. Thanks so much for tuning in. I hope you learned a lot and I hope to see you at my next video. Bye.